why do we do it like this? I mean, we come together, hear a sermon. You could, you could watch my sermon tomorrow online after Jen posts it to our app or on, on YouTube. There are plenty of sermons on, on the web or uh, get some FM frequencies going. You, you can learn a lot of stuff. So, but why do we meet together? This is a really important question. Now that we, we praise God together, and there, there are a lot of things that, that we do together. We could, we could do them on our own, but why, why do we do it this way? Because if, if there's something about this that, you know, isn't, isn't the way we should be doing it, if, it, if it's not what God has in mind, you know, if God's thinking, hmm, I, I don't, you know, that's nice, but, you know, they could do something else, then, then, <laughs> then what are we doing? We, we want to be pleasing to God, so, so we need to ask, what are we doing? What, what are we doing together? We could call it gathering. Uh, we could call it community. We could call it being a church family or the body of Christ. Uh, what a great analogy. You know, we're each a part of the body, but unified as a whole. Because I think of myself as one body. Like, there's a lot of unity here in my body. That's such a great analogy. But we all have a, a part of that in the body of Christ. The Bible also uses the word fellowship. Um, I don't know about you, but that word always makes me think of the Fellowship of the Ring, which is the first book or movie in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Let's watch 20 seconds of that. If by my life or death, I can protect you. I will. You have my soul. And you have my bow. And my axe. This is a much more appropriate picture of fellowship than I used to think of when I was younger, a, a fellow in a ship. Um, it's interesting <laughs> that the Bible's word that we translate into fellowship which honestly, I mean, we, I just, I still always think of fellows, you know, which some of us are, but the Bible's word is koinonia. It's a Greek word. Uh, literally, it can mean a contribution. Do you ever think of fellowship as a contribution uh, or contributory help? It's participatory. Koinonia is communal participation. Uh, it's like the word community. Community is kind of a buzzword, uh, but think of its participatory nature. That's fellowship. So I chose this clip because Aragon says to Frodo, you can have my sword. And in saying that, he's not just giving him his sword. He's saying, you can have me and my ability to fight. He's offering himself to the mission. And, uh, and Legolas says, you can have my bow. And Gimli says, and my axe. They're contributing uh, koinonia to the whole. Um, sometimes, if you're like me, and you, when I think of communal, I can't help but think of the word communism. Uh, there are differences with that. Uh, com communism tends to be a bad word uh, to most of us because it tends to have horrific results. I think because what human really can, can shoulder, can single-mindedly shoulder the, the weight of the leadership of a communist nation? I would say only Jesus has the infinite wisdom, selfless compassion, and perfect sense of justice to lead that type of operation, especially when all the people you're leading are sinners. And yet, communing together in our free will, that is something beautiful. And Jesus does call us to community. 
And I think we'd all agree community is good. And Jesus wants us to be in community that is gospel-centered, meaning that Jesus and his leadership is at the center. It's fellowship, where we're gathering and we're giving of ourselves. What does Scripture say about our relationships and how God intends to use them to accomplish his purposes in us and accomplish his purposes through us? In us and through us and for him. So we have in and out and up going on. And we need to know what does Jesus-centered community look like? Why is it important? Like, if you already have friends, am I telling you that you need to get more friends? I remember my roommate in college, we were just shooting the breeze one day, and he said, you know, I think I've, I've met everybody I ever want to meet. I'm, I'm done. Got all my friends. <laughs> and I thought that was a little odd, but... Um, I was glad I, was, I had already met him, but um, I can kind of see his point. I mean, right? If you, have, if you have a bunch of friends, when do you get full up? You know, I, I'm, if, I'm, I'm full. I'm booked. I've, I've got all my, all my relationships done. Or is there something missing in that statement? Or uh, completely different example, any of you with kids at home, I'm betting your family has a list of needs longer than the amount of time you have to meet those needs. Is it really important to find more relationships? We need to know, what is Jesus-centered community, and what does it look like, and why is it important? Let's look at Acts chapter 2 in your pew Bible. That's on page 1694. We'll start, we'll back up a little bit to verse 36 and get some context. Peter is speaking to a large crowd here in Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this, Peter says. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children, and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized. Right there, they were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So suddenly, all of a sudden, a church of 3,000. Can you imagine what that would be like? So this is what they did. And we're going on to verse 42. This is our text for today. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. That's koinonia, participatory community. And to the breaking of bread. Here, that's just eating meals together. And to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. So to unpack this a little bit, I want to start with some reasons we don't need community. These are not good reasons, but they're reasons. We all have our, our unique reasons fitted to our personalities. Whether you're a person who is driven to form new relationships or not, that's not really the point. We all have struggles that keep us from experiencing community the way that Jesus would like us to. 
We all have reasons that tempt us to hang back because Satan loves for us to miss out on gospel-centered community. In fact, some of us may have never experienced it because Satan loves to keep it at arm's length whenever possible. There are steps you can take toward community, but I want you to recognize that sometimes there are factors beyond our control that stand in the way. Those things certainly need prayer, and beyond that, they're, they're just in God's hands. But today, I want to recognize how we hang back from koinonia community and how we can more effectively move toward each other and toward God. Our sin nature causes all sorts of mess for us. And the core problem of our sin nature is that we want to be like God, the Bible says. Be like God. This means in a variety of ways we make efforts to elevate ourselves. Paul describes the opposite of this as he describes Jesus' humility in Philippians 2. That even though Jesus is God, he did not consider equality with God to be something that he would use for himself. And yet, we are tempted to do the opposite. Even though we are not God, we tend to elevate ourselves. And this is pride, and this is the core of sin. And Bible says God, the Bible says God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Um, so pride is common to all cultures of the world, but in, American, but in America, pride sneaks in undetected as individualism. It has been said that individualism, like a lens that we look through, colors American lives in ways that we don't notice. I'm not talking about ourselves as individuals uniquely created to specifically uh, fulfill God's plan for our lives, our special personalities, our special gifts. We need each other. We need interdependence, working as the body of Christ, the places where I'm lacking. I need your help. In the places you're lacking, you need my help. And this is actually the opposite of individualism. That we as individuals need each other is, is how it should be, and that's how we're made. But individualism is where we strive not to need each other. Um, so here are some reasons why, why we uh, don't need community. Here they are, and let's take a look at this list. Uh, the next slide over there, yeah, and X out the background, yeah, great, okay. Um, these, these five come from a book called Gospel-Centered Community, um, which has a few of my sermon points in it, and um, it's by Bob Thune and Will Walker, Gospel-Centered Community. Um, we have Self-Reliance. Self-sufficiency, self-protection, self-importance, and self-will. They sort of create these five areas. They notice they all start with self, which is selfish. It's the opposite of uh, humility. So uh, what do these mean? Well, this is, this is from Thune and Walker. Um, I've selected some of their uh, the top three, in my opinion, points under each one. Um, See what you think. Self-reliance. You enjoy being asked for help, but you rarely ask others for help. You don't honestly think you need people in order to grow spiritually. Personal spiritual disciplines are sufficient. Bible study and prayer, theological reading can be done all on your own. It's hard for you to receive gifts or help from people without feeling obligated to pay them back somehow. Let's go into self-sufficiency. You may be thought of as a good Christian by others, but few people know you as you really are. You may be outgoing and extroverted, but your relationships stay on the surface. When relationships get hard, you withdraw rather than dealing with the issues. You tend to measure spiritual growth by how much you know as I thought about this one, I think it, that, that means rather than how you relate to others, your spiritual growth stays in the sphere of knowledge. Self-protection. You tend to keep others at arm's length to guard against being hurt. 
You fear at times that if people knew the real you, they would keep their distance. You might be addicted to approval. Your sense of value rises and falls on what people say or do not say about you. I'm not reading this to, to beat you over the head, um, but look at what we're up against, right? Uh, if, if you're like me, um, you, you could use a tune-up in all these areas, depending on the, the day or, or the minute. Uh, but healthy community has serious challenges, so we need to recognize them. Self-importance. You tend to be addicted to busyness. It's the way you fill the void of deep relationships in your life. You're more concerned with what others think than your accomplish. Uh, what is, you're more concerned with what others think of your accomplishments than what they think of your relational influence in their lives. You measure spiritual growth by what you've accomplished. And lastly, self-will. You schedule uh, your schedule and priorities always take precedence. You don't reshuffle your agenda to help anyone. Uh, you like having people around, but you don't tend to welcome their advice or correction. And lastly, when it comes to church or any other group you're in, you tend to ask consumer-oriented questions like, what do I like or not like about this? How does this make me feel? What did I get out of this? Your goals are prioritized over the needs of the community and the mission of the church. Holy Spirit, we need you every moment to lead us. These are tough things. So I don't read this for the sake of diagnosis only, but the bottom line is, how can we practice being free from all of this stuff without practicing them in community? There's no way to learn humility on your own. Your sanctification, meaning the goodness and Christ-likeness that God is building into you, is dependent upon community. Did you ever notice how patient you are when no one else is bugging you? Or how loving you are when you're surrounded by kind and wonderful people? Or how humble you are until someone tells you how you did poorly? Every one of us is a saint when no one else is around. If you're only humble when people admire you, that's called false humility. Real humility is when someone tells you all the things you could have done better and you remain considerate and loving, especially if you see the whole situation much differently. Real community, just like in family, exposes us. We begin to, uh, we, we see each other at our worst. Our weaknesses, our sins are brought to light. Yes, Jesus has justified us and cleansed us of sin, made us new creations, as the Bible says. And we can't live a life patterned after Jesus without community. So I titled the sermon, uh, God's Powerful Tool of Community, and I've identified two areas, two large areas where God uses community in us as a uh, transformational tool. Um, he does his work in us, and he does his work through us. We can put that sermon slide back up even. Great. In us and through us. We are created for community, and our sanctification, our spiritual formation, depends on it. First, in us. Community as a tool for spiritual formation. We are created for community. God himself is community. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all three persons of the Trinity are in unity, making up the being of God. God doesn't need us in order to have community. He communes with himself. And God tells us in Genesis that we are made in his image. We reflect him. So we are also made for community. But human beings, unlike God's being, we're not made in triplicate. So we have a deep longing for community. It's a way we're made. If it's something we all want, why is it so hard to get? This is where the gospel and the whole of scripture intersects, breaks in, to our relationships 
with each other. Uh, the gospel is primarily about our relationship with God. Uh, what other relationship could take front seat in our lives? We were created with. Uh, we were created for a relationship with God. Sin entered the world through Adam and Eve, and our fellowship with God was broken. We call that the fall. We fell from relationship with God. Then Jesus came to seek and save the lost. He sought us out. He made a way for us to be clean of sin and brought us back into a pure relationship with God. Now he transforms us and sanctifies us as we follow him. This is our story, the gospel in, in broad terms. The same is true in community. We're created for community. We fell. Sin entered and our relationships became hard and messy. And then there's redemption. And this is where we need Jesus' life and Jesus' gospel to intersect. Did you have it all together in order to be saved by Jesus? No. Did Jesus, in fact, want you to come to him in the opposite way? Realizing your sin, realizing your brokenness, coming before him with great humility. God, forgive me, a sinner is the pattern we need to embrace. I need you, Jesus. And these are the principles by which gospel-centered community functions. We don't come before God saying, please accept me, look how great I am, and neither do we come before each other that way. As a worship leader, Jason Upton, he likes to talk about in one of his songs how so often our Christian strategy is to put on our best front, to always show our best side and keep evil hiding behind us. But this strategy is full of pride, and it will always put a wall between you and others and between you and God. In gospel-centered community or any community, uh, this is not a good strategy. On the other hand, people can find acceptance apart from Christian community, uh, whether it's among, among any group of people who uh, measure sin by their own standards, measures morality in their own way, whether it's in a bar or anywhere, you can find this. Uh, maybe people who are even proud of their sins. They'll certainly accept your sins as well. But what if gospel-centered community is completely different than either one? What if in our humility we're willing to put our sins and struggles out there, but not to be proud of it, just to be real, and our boast is in Jesus? This is what's gospel-centered about it. As, as Paul says, God forbid that I should boast in anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me. He wants nothing of worldly pride He's boasting in Jesus' goodness. You see, in both the examples, whether we're showing off our good Christianness or being proud of our sin, in both those examples, we're showing off. It's all a show. A hypocrite is not just someone who says one thing and does another. It comes from the Greek theater. A hypocrite is literally an actor. That's what the word means. And, and you know in, in Greek theater how they wore those happy face masks and those sad face masks. It's putting on a mask. I'm not saying you spill your beans to every person in the hallway, but where can you be real? Where are you accepted, encouraged, and prayed for? And on the flip side, who are you accepting, who are you praying for, and who is encouraged by you? Sometimes we have to be very intentional about this. Ask God, where are you going to find this type of community if you don't have it. So two things about this community is functional and formational. Functional meets our need, but if we only view community as functional, we're taking a self-centered approach, and when it ceases to meet our need, we're done with it. But community as God intended is also formational. It's a power tool for our spiritual formation and for our sanctification, meaning the goodness and purity that God is tilling into our lives. That's what community does in us. Many of you can relate to this principle in marriage. 
Uh, maybe you've seen the book by Gary Thomas called The Sacred Marriage, and I always remember the subtitle, What If God Designed Marriage to Make Us Holy More Than to Make Us Happy? And I think that subtitle is true, really in all areas of our life. What does James in the Bible say about trials? To be happy about them, because they help you grow in your faith and make you a mature and complete person. So when God wants to make us holy, we can be happy about that. Because I want completeness. I want to be a mature and complete person. And that's why when there's friction or tension in a relationship and, and things heat up, if you're always blaming the other person, you're never getting to the goodness of what God has for you. You have to hold up the mirror. Even if the other person is at fault in some way, you have to ask, God, what are you doing in this? And that question takes me right out of the heat of the moment if I remember to ask it. God, what are you working in me? Holy Spirit, teach me how to be patient, self-controlled, how to give grace. God, what are you doing in this, in this trial? If we look back in chapter, Acts chapter 2, what we already read, verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. They were devoted to fellowship. They knew that fellowship, just like the knowledge they were getting from the apostles' teaching, they knew that fellowship was equally as worthy of their devotion for the sake of their spiritual formation. Jumping down to 46, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God. There's gladness, sincerity, and praising God because of this. Sincere hearts. The Greek here, literally a simple heart, an unencumbered heart, nothing complicated by human pride. No defense mechanisms, just authenticity. With all this meeting together, you might be wondering, yes, alone time is good too. Yes, solitary spiritual disciplines are good too. That's all biblical, but it does not replace community. So we are looking at God's powerful tool of community in us. We were created for it. Fellowship is koinonia, participatory. Community is contributory. It's sacrificial. And the gospel teaches us how to be in community. Just as we come before God in humility, not in our good works, we get with each other in that same type of simplicity, in that same type of humility. I'm just bringing me. It's just me. I'm not the wittiest person. I'd like to be but you're not going to get all that. I'm not all that put together. If, if you thought I am, I'm sorry that I have been misleading you. But what God is doing in me, I boast in that. What good is in me that's not from God? What can I show off to you that's not from Him? Even my clothes, even if I'm remotely in style, that's by the grace of God. Somebody let me know if skinny jeans ever go out of style because I probably won't notice. Um, <laughs> and lastly, uh, community is not just functional, it's formative. It's not to meet my needs. It's to form me and shape me. It's spiritual formation molding me to be more like Jesus. God's powerful tool of community at work in us. Remember I said in us and through us? Uh, next week we're going to look at through us, uh, the through us part. Certainly community is much more than what God is doing in us. God uses us to touch each other, and often God's, God puts us in community for the sake of others, maybe even more than for ourselves many times. You know, there are a lot of ways I could make application to Bible studies or small groups, but simply, if God has your attention in this this morning and you think you need more of this in your life uh, and you don't know where to look, 
just just write me a note on the comment card or connection card. Leave it in the basket in the back. I'll give you a call. We'll we'll find a spot where this is working for you. Or maybe you know right now who you need to connect with. Maybe it's for you. Maybe it's for the other person. Maybe it's for both. Chances are it is for both of you. The past few weeks, uh, Trent has made the call to uh, be reading the Bible daily, uh, even uh, reading through Proverbs, one a day, uh, and find a Bible reading partner, a person that you can meet with every once in a while and, and talk about what you're reading. Um, this is a great way to have community uh, simply with one other person. It goes deep fast when you talk about what God's Word is doing in you because His Word is alive and active, and it's going to work in your life. God will speak to you through His Word. But the call to action that I want to put out there to everybody this morning is this. Whomever we're with, that the gospel of Jesus would intersect our relationships in a way that we find our identity and goodness in him, resulting in Acts 2, 46, where it said, there were sincere, unencumbered hearts, simple hearts, and we turn the praise back to him. We're praising him. We're looking at his goodness and not our own, and his gladness can come back down to us from Acts 2.46. They were glad, sincere, and praising God. Let's go to Jesus in prayer.